just want to thank you for showing up. Not just showing up, but I want to thank you for the way that you showed up. I felt like people, people came eager and earnest, like ready, needing to meet with God, and, and we've done that. And um, as the conference has gone on, um, this, might <laughs> uh, this might come as a surprise, but I, I didn't necessarily know what I would speak on. Um, but as the conference has gone on, I just really sense the Holy Spirit um, has impressed upon my heart a story. And I believe that this story really captures what we've experienced this week um, and gives us kind of language for what's gone on the past few days. But I also feel like this story is calling us into the next year. I feel like this story is calling us into the next season as a family of churches uh, together. And so I think that this story is going to give us some language and some framework for where uh, we're headed uh, as a family, or I would submit that to you, because <clears throat> we know that story is so important. Um, we've known that for a long time. Stories are so important in a family. They're so important in this process of batons being passed from one generation uh, to another. We've always known their significance, um, but, the, the, but the pandemic took this to a whole new level because stories, they eat science and data for lunch. <laughs> they do. The story someone is telling themselves just cannot be bothered by data. They're so powerful. No one can talk to you at the rate that you're talking to yourself. And so we go find studies to support the story that we're living in, the story that we're telling ourselves. So here's a story I think we're supposed to live into. And uh, I'm going to read from 2 Kings chapter 4, if you want to turn there. And I'm going to make some comments and bring some thoughts. And I'm hopeful that I'm going to give some language to what God is wanting to do um, with us as we go from here. God, would you help me bring some language to what you want to do as we go from here? 2 Kings chapter 4, one day Elisha went to Shunem, and a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. And then she said to her husband, I know that this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. Let's make a small room on the roof and put in it a bed and a table and a chair and a lamp for him. And he can stay there whenever he comes to us. And one day when Elisha came, he went up to his room and he lay down there. And he said to his servant Gehazi, call the Shunammite. So he called her and she stood before him. And Elijah said to him, tell her, you've gone to all this trouble for us. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or the, to the commander of the army? And she replied, well, I have a home among my own people. What can be done for her? Elisha asked. And Gehazi said, she has no son and her husband is old. And then Elijah said, call her. So he called her and she stood in the doorway about this time next year, Elisha said, you'll hold a son in your arms. No. No, my Lord. Please. Man of God, don't. Don't mislead your servant. But the woman became pregnant 
And the next year, about that same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elijah had told her. And the child grew, and one day he went out to his father, who was with the reapers. And he said to his father, my head, my head. And his father told the servant, carry him to his mother. After the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. And she went up, and she laid him on the bed of the man of God, and then shut the door and went out. And she called her husband and said, please send me one of the servants and a donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly and return. Why go to him today, he asked. It's not the new moon or Sabbath. That's all right, she said. And she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, lead on, don't slow down for me unless I tell you. So she sent out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. And when he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant Gehazi, look, there's the Shunammite. Run to meet her and ask her, are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? And everything's all right, she said. And when she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet and Gehazi came over to try to push her away. But the man of God said, leave, leave her alone. She is in bitter distress, but the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord, she said. Didn't I tell you, don't raise my hopes? And Elisha said to Gehazi, tuck your cloak in your belt, take my staff in your hand and run. Don't greet anyone you meet. And if anyone greets you, do not answer and lay my staff on the boy's face. But the child's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So he got up and followed her. And Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and told him, the boy has not awakened. And when Elisha reached the house, there was a boy lying dead on his couch. And he went in and he shut the door on the two of them and he prayed to the Lord. And then he got on the bed and he lay on the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. As he stretched himself out on him, the boy's body grew warm. And then Elijah turned away and he walked and he paced back and forth in the room and then got back on the bed and stretched him out, stretched out on him once more. And the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. And Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, call the Shunammite. And he did. And when she came, he said, take your son. And she came in and she fell at his feet. She bowed to the ground. Then she took her son in her arms once again and went out. As I initially read this text, I was taken by this uh, mother and the very apparent ways in which hope deferred had made her heart sick. And I just can hear her pain. You can hear her despair. Um, and you can hear joy as you read this story. And I want to say this, and you know this, but I want to remind you that anytime we talk about family in our churches, we're playing with fire. <laughs> that is a loaded term. It is loaded with longing. It is loaded with desire. It's loaded with deep, unspoken 
expectations. And then as a result, consequently, it is loaded with deep pain and disappointments. So we go on and we're like, hey, mothers, fathers, sons, daughters. And I'm not suggesting that we stop using that language because that's the language of scripture. What I'm asking you to recognize is that we're using words that represent people's deepest longings, some of their deepest fears and frustrations. And we see this in the mother who loses her son. So the story is pretty easy to follow. They're feeding Elijah as he comes through. Then they build a bungalow for Elijah, a little guest house for the prophet out back. And the prophet is so genuinely blessed by this place of rest and refreshment that he says, what can I do for you? And the woman says, I'm I'm, I'm good. But it's Elijah's servant that finds out that she's not good. He finds out she's without child. And then Elijah says, by this time next year, you're going to have a son. And she's like, don't, just don't. I've got no prayers left to pray. I've got no tears left to shed. Just don't. Not this subject. You're touching some of my deepest desires. And in doing so, you're touching a place of profound pain. Don't, Don't tease me. Don't talk with me like this on this subject. She had so shut her heart down to survive. When Elijah says, is there anything I can do? She's like, nope, I'm good. I'm good because I'm not going to ask for that again. That hurts. Too bad. I'm good. So the prophet is not messing with her. She becomes pregnant, and she gives birth to a son, and as he grows, one day they're out in the field at harvest, and he complains about pain in his head. And um, dad tells the servant, probably dad thinks it's nothing big, tells the servant, I'll take him home uh, to his mom, And he grows uh, sicker and sicker until uh, hours later at noon, he is dead. And the the mother who is promised, you will hold a son uh, in your arms, is now holding her son's like lifeless body uh, in her arms. And she rides to the prophet. She rides to the prophet I think she gives a bogus answer to Gehazi just to get past the guy at the gate, you know? I'm 21, you know, right through. (laughs) Just look confident, you know, look 21. Gets right past him, and in her desperation, she grabs his feet. And Gehazi's trying to pull her off of him, and he says, don't. She's in bitter distress. And she essentially says, did I initiate this conversation? Did I ask for a son or did you offer a son to me? And I told you not to raise my hopes. And we can all relate to this. We can all relate to this in this conversation that surrounds fathers and mothers, both physical and spiritual. And we can all relate to this when it comes to sons and daughters, both physical and spiritual sons and daughters. And I think we can all relate to this conversation when it even comes to revival and contending again for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Don't tease me. Don't tease me. You're touching a deep place of pain. And I'm good. I'm good. Glad that this seems to be working out for others. I'm good. (laughs) 
I meet with church planters and I talk to them about the cast of characters in my church. And I say, what you need to get is a Mark Condi. And church planters just look at me and go, don't, don't, don't tease me. Don't touch the longing that I have for a father. And sometimes we talk to parents or we put these uh, videos up on the screen that are celebrating succession, celebrating sons and daughters, taking up the cause and now loving and worshiping Jesus. And I just felt like there was some people in the room as we've been discussing this subject that you're just like, I'm good. Don't. Don't touch this place. I've got... No prayers left to pray. I've got no tears left in my face. And I sensed the pain uh, in this uh, room. And of course, it's right to celebrate the wins. Of course, it's right to celebrate what happened with Tim and Jerron. And it's been far from easy. The three minutes doesn't capture it. And we all know that. But we've also suffered some losses, haven't we? We've invested our lives in spiritual sons who started with such promise, had a supernatural start, in fact, but have fallen in the field. While we were working, they fell. There was such destiny, and the future was so bright. There was so much promise. In fact, the Lord's hand was on it to get it started. And it, they fell, it fell somewhere in the field. And fathers and mothers have fallen and sons and daughters have fallen. And there's something in us, there's a dull ache here that goes, I don't know if I want to touch that place again. At one point you were holding a sense of promise in this area. And now you're holding a sense of hurt, resentment, maybe a sense of grief and, and death. And I, I had a sense, I'm not trying to mess with anybody, and this is not the, the close of a conference that I anticipated. Um, but I had a deep sense that we were to cry out for prodigals. Sons and daughters who had a supernatural start, had a sense of destiny on their life, but fell somewhere along the way. And as I poured over this text, I felt the Lord remind me and, and just say to me that they may have something going on in their head, but I still hold their heart. Their thoughts have been taken captive They've been taken captive by those hollow and deceptive philosophies, but I felt like the Lord wanted to remind you, the issue is in their head, but I still hold their heart. And I felt like we were supposed to contend again for resurrection power, for God to raise the dead, for us to cling to his feet again and say, did I start this? Or did you promise there's still words. And I know there's some of you, you're, you're like, oh man, don't, don't mess with me here. I was 23. I took over uh, the youth group in Mark Condy's church and I led a beach camp. And it was, uh, Tiffany and I were newly married and my little brother showed up. He would have been 20 years old at the time. He was living in Los Angeles. So he met me at the beach and late one night, um, we had a conversation where he shared with me that he was gay and he shared with me that he'd be leaving the, the faith. Um, not necessarily because he didn't believe, but we didn't want him around as kind of an, an untouchable, uh, a leper in our community. And so we talked for hours and we wept together. My mom, who was trying to help me out as a young youth pastor, 
she came and she was running the chuck wagon, you know, trying to feed the group of kids. And so she came to me the next day so excited. And she was like, I saw you were talking to Matt. And there was lots of tears, you know. And I'm like, he's going he's gonna to destroy you. And we held that secret for a lot of years because we were like, my mom's going to die. The last 25 years in my brother's life have been 20 years, have been really messy. But after that, I remember visiting my brother in LA and my brother had a new tattoo behind his ear and uh, I couldn't quite make it out because of where it was at and because of the font that was used. <laughs> and I thought it said, I thought it said flow. Um, and we, we have an ant flow that we love. In fact, I tried to name our youngest daughter flow <laughs> until my wife told me that is actually a reference to something else. <laughs> and I was mortified. I was so upset because my brother and I, we love Aunt Flo. Like, <laughs> she's our favorite. Like, we, we love her. So I was like, did you get Flo's name tattooed on your head? Like, is that what I'm seeing behind your ear? And he says, no, it's the, it's, it's the word his. And... Uh, I was like, you know, this, this is a great summary of our relationship. I was like, is that like a gay thing or what, you know? And he was like, no, it's not. It's not, it's not a gay thing. And I was like, well, what kind of a thing is it, you know? And uh, he goes on to tell me this story. <laughs> He goes on to tell me this story where he ODs and he's in a Los Angeles ER room. And when he comes to, the doctor says, did you grow up in church? And my brother says, yeah, why? And he says, when you were in and out of consciousness and when you were fighting for your life, you were singing a church, you were singing a song that my kids sing in church. I am my beloved's and he is mine. And his banner over me is love. And he just kept singing it. And so my brother got a tattoo of his behind his ear. My brother is still a mess. I have no clue what's going to happen with my brother. But here's what I do know. And here's what I feel like the Lord wants to remind us of today. It's not over. It is not over. It is not over. I just had a sense. The issue is in their head, but he still holds their heart. I just felt like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm feeling, and I don't know where the pain points are in this room. But there's something that's like, man, don't mess with this. I'm good. And I felt like there were people that you've got a dull ache in this area. And I know you've got no prayers left to pray, but I felt like we were supposed to surround you 
And we were supposed to cry out. We don't, you can't, there's not enough time to tell the story. But if you've got a son or a daughter, either a physical son or a daughter or a spiritual son or daughter that fell somewhere in the field, I felt like we were supposed to cry out on your behalf and surround you and just declare life and that it is not over. And so if you are here and you have a sense, I'm not asking you to do something. I'm not asking you. I don't want to mess with you. I'm not trying to mess with you. But I'm asking you to stand because I want to surround you. How many of you here are prodigals? Like you, took a, like, you took, like you took off for a while. Like you went on a walk. <laughs> if you're here and you have a son or a daughter that you're still contending for, would you stand? And could we just lay our hands on these and just cry out on their behalf? It's not over. Declare life. We don't have time to tell the story. But would you just lift your voices on their behalf? Fill us with hope again. Give us hope again. So the woman... So the woman gets to the prophet and she says, I, I told you not to raise my hopes. And then what does Elijah do next? He sends Gehazi and he sends Gehazi with his staff. And I, I want to now just speak to you. I feel like I was speaking to you as a, as a mother, as a father as a son and as a daughter. Um, but I, I want to transition from maybe how you are doing into what you are doing. And I want to speak to you as a leader. I want to speak to you as a, as a pastor. And I want to say, I think one of the things that we've learned this week is that it's not enough to send your staff. Elijah sends Gehazi, he sends a servant, and he sends the servant with his staff, but it wasn't enough, it didn't change the situation. And I want to speak to you and say, you're going to have to bring your weight to bear on this situation. You can't farm this out. You can't tell somebody else to go see about this. You can't send your staff. can't give this away. <laughs> this is ours. You're going to need to get involved. We started a gap year in our church because I was, I kept hearing report, like uh, our young adults would take off. They would come back from a YWAM DTS, having seen some really cool things, but really sorting through some stuff afterwards as well. And we've done that with not just YWAM, but with circuit riders, with the 18-inch journey, any number of things. And I found myself living in complaint. Like, I wish when they came back from these parachurch organizations, they wouldn't circle the airport and they'd land the plane. And I wish this, and I wish this, and I wish that. And it's just so much easier to complain than it is to do something about it. And this gap year wouldn't have happened in my church if I didn't bring my weight to bear on it. And if I didn't say, I'm not just going to complain about what other people are doing. I'm going to do something about it. I'm not going to send a staff member to see about it. I'm going to bring my weight to bear on this situation. Leader, pastor in your church, bring your weight to bear on this situation. Can't farm this out. Don't farm this out to some underpaid camp counselor. Like, you go. 
You go, you do this. Secondly, this woman drags this boy, this corpse, and she lays him where? Right in Elijah's bed, like his couch, like what was his Airbnb, like his place of rest, a place of rest and refreshment now has a situation in it. A dead body for days in your bed. And if this hasn't happened to you yet, it's going to happen. People keep invading my space with these situations. The place that was a refuge from the madness and a meal for the man of God now has a situation in it. This has come for your comfort. This has come to your place of rest and refreshment. And we don't like this, do we? I, I mean, I like my office. I like my books. I like my couch if the books get boring. I like my chair. I like my coffee. I sometimes like routine. One of the things I've noticed with this next generation, my girls get, they, they want to talk at 9 p.m. At like 9 p.m., they're kind of like, they just open up, you know? And you're just like, you have come for my comfort. You have just, you've invaded my space. I, I lay down next to your mom. That's where I lay, you know? It's my spot and you're in it. I started, uh, there's this group of young guys, they're bright, and I started like cereology in my backyard because I really love cereal at 10 p.m. <laughs> like, I could do it every night. Over ice cream any day, a bowl of cereal is the thing. And so I just thought, I'm gonna invite these dudes over. We're all gonna take cereal at 10 p.m. <laughs> and then we're gonna talk theology. And so he had like cereology, so... The conversation around predestination kicked off at about 11.30 p.m., you know. They've come for your comfort. Elisha stretches himself out. And I thank God for words. And I thank God for study, but there's a time to just stretch yourself out. And beloved, let us love with both word and deed. And I, I'm just trying to picture in my head the awkward situation. <laughs> and I think I felt so stirred by Chris because sometimes I do, I want wise and persuasive words, but what I want more is a demonstration of the Spirit's power. And he stretches himself out. He calls in power. And he's eye to eye, it says. He's mouth to mouth and he's hand to hand on this corpse. And one of the things that's been really difficult for me as a parent is that my kids don't do what I say. <laughs> they do what I do. And one of the most difficult things about being a father in my church is that my church doesn't do what I say. They do what I do. I got to sit with a small group of pastors uh, with Jack Hayford. God rest his soul. And he says, if you want a worshiping church, you got to be in the front row as a worshiping pastor. And if you want an evangelistic church, then do a series on evangelism. Sorry, that's sarcasm. <laughs> Evangelize. Yeah. Tell the stories. Yeah. 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 <laughs> eye to eye, because they'll see what you see. Mouth to mouth, because they'll say what you say. Hand to hand, because they'll do what you do. That's how this works. 
That's how this works. And so the question becomes, man of God, woman of God, what do you see? I see dry bones. Man of God, woman of God, what do you say? What do you say? Because that's what they're going to say. What do you do? Because that's what they're going to do. Lastly, Elisha, he doesn't settle for warm. I love this part of the story. I don't actually know what's going on here, but I think I know what's going on here. So Elijah's laying on him. The boy's body begins to warm, but warm's not it, is it? Warm is and has always been spit out. And that's been hard for us as a nation. I used to say that with such like bravado, you know? It'll spit you out of your mouth. That's been brutal in our churches. But the days of some warm cultural Christianity, they're over. They're over. And he doesn't settle with warm. Elijah doesn't go, well, he's, he's warming up. And we can't settle. You've seen the stats. Gen Z is warm to God. Gen Z is warm to the idea of church. And they're also warm to a bunch of other ideas. And warm's not it. We don't stop till this is infused with divine life. And we don't settle with warm. We don't settle with it in our churches. I once was lost and now I'm warmed. That's not what we're going for. We stay on it till it's infused with divine life. Until the breath of God is now what they're taking in. And what does Elisha do? It gets warm and he gets up and it just says he paces. But we all know what he's doing when he paces. It's what we do when we're pacing. He's praying. Come on, Lord. I mean, I was doing this before my sermon, trying to talk myself into this. Like, come on. on. You're going to be all right. Spirit of God's here. God can raise the dead. That's what he's saying. God can raise the dead. God can raise the dead. Gets back on. Warm. That's not it. That's not what we're going for. You pace and pray till you're raised to divine life. That's, that's what they need. Worship team, would you guys come up? Just felt like declaring over us, the prodigal will return. The prodigal will return. We won't farm this out. We won't. It's not on someone else to do it. Your comfort will be invaded. And we say yes to that. Stretch yourself out. It's awkward. Not as awkward as laying on a corpse. (laughs) Face to face. Mouth to mouth. You'll be all right. (laughs) They will see what you see. So what do you see? Don't settle for warm pace and pray and go again and ask and seek and knock until the situation is invaded with divine life and outpouring of his spirit and the breath of God filling our lungs again, filling our homes again, filling our schools again, filling our churches again. The breath of God is what we need. And of course, we're not going to do any of this because we tried harder or because Travis cried and yelled at us. That's not how this works. We do this because we follow the one who raised our lives from the dead, who stretched himself out over our lives. And now we see what he sees. 
Now we see what he sees and we say what he says and we do what he does. So we're going to conclude our time by taking communion and remembering the faithfulness of God. Interns will be up here handing out the COVID communion. <laughs> and I invite you come forward, but we're going to wait just because there's been such an emphasis on unity here. We're going to wait. We're going to take it together. So would you come as we worship? Get the elements, get back to your seat so that we can toast the faithfulness of God.